Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, I've, I've never gabbled to, to order a meeting of the Cape, Cape Elizabeth Town Council in 38 years. No, never had to do it. But the, the reason I do it tonight is that usually when the council chair isn't here, the finance chair of the, uh, the uh, council presides at the meeting. This evening, uh, the uh, council chair is, had, had known in advance she wasn't going to be able to with us. Uh, Kathy Ray, who's the finance chair, had a family issue come up uh, just within the last hour or so and is unable to be here. So usually the town clerk would call the meeting to order in one of these unusual circumstances. <coughs> but she's busy getting ready for the election this evening. So I, as, as the clerk pro tem, I call the meeting to order. And as, as the only thing I will do is uh, in, in that capacity, other than take the notes hereafter, is to ask if there is a motion to a point uh, to elect a chair pro tem for this meeting. Uh, Patty. Um, I move that we, that Jessica Sullivan be named for chair pro tem if she will so um, accept the job this evening. Thank you. Councillor Grennan, is there a second to that motion? Uh, Councillor, I, I should be taking notes. <laughs> 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 Councillor Garvin, are there any other nominations? Uh, seeing none, all in favor uh, say aye. aye. All opposed, nay, the ayes have it. Jessica, you're in charge. I hope you don't mind, Jessica. No. <laughs> okay. My printer is uh, down. I'll have to share the agenda with a written one with Mike. Please have the roll call. Yes, uh, Chair McCausland. Councillor Garvin. Here. Councillor Brennan. Here. Councillor Jordan. Here. Councillor Lennon. Here. Councillor Ray. Chair Pro Tem Sullivan. Here. <laughs> Great. Um, <clears throat> we all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any town council reports and correspondence? Councilor Garvin? Thank you. Um, I wanted to report out on the activity of the Spurwink School Reuse Committee. Um, some of you may have seen uh, at the, in the first week of June, we put up on the town website, um, and there was also an article in the Cape Courier about uh, a request for information or an RFI that the committee has put together. Um, wanted to just add a little bit of color and context to that in, uh, in this meeting. Um, the committee, uh, you know, over the past year, there's been a lot of input and idea uh, generation from the, from the community, uh, from staff uh, in the town, et cetera, around what to do with the, the former school now that it's no longer being used for uh, the temporary home of the, the library. And um, what our committee, which is an ad hoc committee that was appointed at the beginning of the year, wanted to do was try and standardize to a certain degree um, the types of information that we'd like to see back from interested parties that have an interest in reusing the, the building and the facility. Um, so rather than some of the sort of informal um, ideas that had been generated um, and outlines for, for concepts of, of proposed uses, um, we wanted to try and come up with what, what's a pretty basic 10 or 12 question um, questionnaire as a very initial screening tool. And I, I, I say that with purpose, that it's not intended to be the only step that we're going to take um, to make any decision around this. This is a first step to try and understand who's interested, what they would be interested in for, and a little bit of basic information beyond that. If those that are um, watching or hearing this um, are, are interested, uh, they can reach out to Facilities Director Greg Marles 
the scheduled time to look at the building prior to the June 24th submission deadline. Again, that's June 24th. Um, and uh, from there, the committee will be looking to, you know, evaluate the very initial responses generated and uh, take a look at scheduling further due diligence, whether it be in the form of in-person interviews or further written proposals or things like that. But this initial request is not intended to be overly burdensome for folks that might be interested. It's uh, really just to try and have a level playing field and have everybody responding to a uniform set of questions. So. Um, our next meeting uh, of that committee is Wednesday morning, this Wednesday the 15th at 8 a.m. over at the Thomas Memorial Library. And um, after the submission deadline of the 24th, the committee will next meet again in mid-July. I don't have the date off the top of my head. Um, at which point we'll begin evaluating um, those initial responses. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh. Okay, moving on. Uh, <clears throat> We will have the Finance Committee report. Finance Chairman is not here this evening. Um, I will ask the Town Manager to speak to that if you would like. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Pro Tem Sullivan. I'm trying to remember the titles. Uh, just, I'm not going to give a complete financial report, but you know, sometimes you wonder you see these links on the agenda, and it, it just it made a, a way of explanatory background is. Every month, the town, the town has a monthly report that lists, lists every single line item in the budget and what the expenditure is, what the budget is, how much money was left. Similarly, on the revenues, it lists what the, the, the revenues are expected for the year, what progress we're making, how much is, is the re monthly revenue to date, to date, to the end of the month, and the annual to date. There's also something called a dashboard that summarizes those details. So if anyone wants to find out anything about where the town budget stands, what the town budget is for anything, how we're doing, whether we're overspending, underspending, uh, that's all available online at capeelizabeth.com for anyone to see. Just go to the, the most recent regular council meeting, hit supporting material, and you'll see something that's labeled monthly financial update as of whatever the month is. So uh, there is a report there, uh, generally, uh, Revenues are looking good. Expenditures are looking good. We have what uh, uh, about a little fewer than 20 days left to the end of the fiscal year. There's a couple of accounts that look like they're going to be overspent. The council's being asked for a transfer for a little bit more money to deal with those. It's later on tonight's agenda, but most most budgets are pretty well under. It helped that we didn't have to use a lot of road salt and public works overtime this year. Uh, police overtime has been you know, close to budget, kept uh, kept within the reasonable amounts, and uh, building permit income's doing well, excise tax income's doing well, the states come through with what we expected for revenue sharing, state school subsidies come through as expected, cable franchise fees doing fine, and then sewer fees, uh, believe it or not, those are almost 1.8 million so far since last July, so uh, folks have been paying a lot of those. And uh, we also have Portland headlight sales, and those have actually, that little two-car garage, the sales so far since last July, one have been uh, right around $500,000. Uh, it's a pretty amazing for a little two-car garage, so thank you. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions? I've got one. Um, <clears throat> down here under debt status, um, we're retiring two million one hundred ninety-three thousand two hundred thirty-nine dollars this year. Yeah. Could you remind me and the rest of the council what that's for? What's what debt is being retired? That is all of the, that is you know as at the beginning of the year we had a debt balance of seventeen million two hundred forty-seven thousand two hundred ninety-five dollars. That's various issues for school projects. It's it's uh, things such as. Uh, the community center, the swimming pool that was renovated a while ago, uh, the police station, the public works garage, and some road projects and a whole host of things over the years. What I think what's important to note is that we're retiring 2.2 million roughly. And you know, if you yeah. look at the bond that's proposed, the citizens voting on tomorrow, that's 1.4 million. Mm -hmm. Plus, there's another 600,000 that was authorized for the pool needs a lot of work that's going to be happening in August. And you know, the the amount that's proposed to be borrowing this year is actually less than the amount that's being uh, retired. Right. Okay. Thank you. 
<clears throat> okay, so I will uh, now open the opportunity for citizens who, to discuss something, bring something forward to the town council that is not on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone? <laughs> Great. We need your name and address, please, and you have three minutes. Okay. I am Jim Mora. I'm at 5 Wombeck Road, and I'll speak tonight as a resident. I reviewed the Zoning Board of Appeals, or ZBA, minutes over the last three years. I found 20 appeals have been brought before the ZBA. The only successful appeal was when, and I'll quote from the minutes, the CEO felt the town is better served to have the Zoning Board make the decision. This data makes one wonder if the Zoning Board of Appeals ever accepts appeals not requested by the CEO. Some residents, individually or collectively, feel so strongly that the code ordinance was violated, they appealed the ZBA decision to the Superior Court at an expense of thousands of dollars each. The ZBA minutes include four appeals to the Superior Court over the last three years, and I know of at least one more not in the minutes. Three of these appeals show in the minutes as having Superior Court decisions. All three appeals through the Superior Court were remanded back to the ZBA indicating the ZBA made a wrong decision. That is, 100% of the Superior Court appeals over the last three years from the ZBA were sent back to the ZBA for the ZBA making wrong decisions. What happened on these remands back to the ZBA? All three appeals sent back to the ZBA were rejected, again, for what I see as more creative reasons. How creative? As an example, the June 23, 2015 ZBA meeting heard the appeal of a permit with a lot boundary, with lot boundary errors that allowed a permit to be issued for a deck outside the owner's property. The data on the property boundary errors were presented by the appealers but do not show up in the ZBA statements of facts or conclusion. The ZBA did not address the main reason for the appeal and instead chose to address another issue. This is creative, but not in the best interest of the majority of the residents of Cape Elizabeth. Is the ZBA under a guideline, written or unwritten, that says no appeal will be accepted unless the CEO requests it? What can you do? <coughs> Create checks and balances for the ZBA. The ZBA, as it stands today, has shown they are not responsible with exclusive powers and duties. Two, choose board members' professional backgrounds to better match the population of Cape Elizabeth. Recent ZBA memberships have been largely comprised of attorneys. We cannot expect any board to act in the best interest of the majority of residents if that board is comprised of members with similar backgrounds. Three, choose a ZBA liaison that complements the ZBA member backgrounds and does not further promote differences from the population being served. Thank you for, for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council on a matter not on tonight's agenda? Okay. Next item is actually the town manager's monthly report. Maybe would you like to add? Yeah, I just just briefly, Mr. Moore. Maybe he'll hear me, but <coughs> on his way out the door, I think. Uh, you know, I, I think you need to be careful when you when you look at facts like we, that we just said. Uh, the, the, the zoning board of appeals, you know, does back up the code enforcement officer most of the time because the code enforcement, code enforcement officer, I think, does a good job. Uh, he, he, he looks at the rules, he looks at the laws, and, you know, neighbors don't like some of the decisions. They, they appeal it. But that's not to say that the code enforcement officer is wrong. Uh, you know, he's, he's interpreted it. You know, I would expect that he's going to get it right most of the time. So it, it's not surprising to me that the zoning board would back the code enforcement officer most of the time. Secondly, it was said by the previous speaker that, that there were four cases that, that were sent back to, that the, that the courts ruled against the zoning board. You know, I, I think you need to look at those four cases. What the courts found in most of those cases is that there were insufficient findings in the record to support the decision. That is not the same thing as saying that they made an error in judgment 
of interpretation of the ordinance. In fact, if you look at most of the Superior Court cases where they hear Zoning Board of, Board of Appeals under Rule ADB or some other policy, generally the, the court does not interpret the law to substitute its judgment for the Zoning Board. It instead looks at the procedures and looks to see whether or not uh, the, uh, uh, you know, that there were su sufficient findings to support a specific decision. So, you know, I, I just think, you know, I'd, I'd love to get a copy of Mr. Moore's statement. You know, we have it actually, we have it, the audio recording of it uh, to, to look at all the different issues and facts. But I, I, it's, it's not as simple as it, as it seems. And, you know, I'm pleased that the zoning board uh, is finding the code enforcement officer uh, has acted correctly in most cases. And I'm pleased that the court looks at the cases when people have grievances and appeals and see that maybe the record isn't sufficient. But, you know, it, it, that would be, I think, the reason why it came back to the zoning board three times and they eventually ruled somewhat in favor of the applicant because they, they, they did look at additional findings and studied the case some more. <coughs> and in those cases, you know, if there, if there were further appeals, the appeals generally have gone the way of the town or the folks have dropped them. I realize it's, it's expensive, uh, but, you know, the other side of it is people have property rights. And, you know, oftentimes people don't like it that the next door neighbor has property rights. And as a result, someone wants to do something, the neighbors oppose it, and, uh, you know, we go to court. That's the American judicial system. That, that's fine, uh, but I, I, just, I just think to categorically say that, that there's, a, there's, a, there's, a major, there's a major problem because the court, court enforcement officer is backed up is, is just not in keeping with uh, that isn't a problem, that's something good. Uh, and, end of, end of uh, <laughs> diatribe. <laughs> thank you. Um, hey, and I could, can I continue my time in his report? Sure. <laughs> I just want to thank everyone involved with organizing Memorial Day. It, it rained. Uh, you know, we didn't have all the usual festivities, but uh, the, 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 the Veterans uh, Memorial over there, if any, you know, I encourage everyone, even though maybe they didn't go to Memorial Day, go visit it. it uh, it's, a, it's a good place to, for quiet contemplation of uh, what, what the men and women who have sacrificed their lives offered. The flowers are over there. Beautiful. There's been, there's been a change. I don't know if it's occurred yet on listing the, the, the different uh, wars and other events that, that people participated in. But again, want to thank all those involved with preparing for Memorial Day and uh, seeing that it, you know, at least the people didn't go out in what was, in what, what was supposed to be bad weather, uh, that at least you know, the monument looked nice, the cemetery was all ready to go and, and the rest of it. Uh, secondly, I also want to mention Family Fun Days this weekend and uh, uh, encourage everyone to visit and see what's going on. It's at Fort, Fort Williams Park. Uh, late morning is the best time to go around noontime. A uh, good place to buy food that's bad for you. And uh, although some of it's good for you, and to see a lot of kids having fun. So, great. Thank you. All right, next, <clears throat> we're going to review draft minutes of May 9, 2016, and May 19, 2016. First, may I have a motion to approve the draft minutes of May 9, 2016? So moved. Second. Is there, is there a second? Thank you, sir. Uh, Council Lennon. Um, are there any errors or admissions? All those in favor? Uh, it's approved. And well, for the, made the motion? Uh, Council Grennan, seconded by Council Lennon. I get the second. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the next next one is the May 19, 2016 meeting. Could I have a motion for approval? Uh, Council Lennon? I move we accept the minutes of the May 19, 2016 meeting. Is there a second? Sure, I'll second. Council Grennan, okay. Any errors or omissions? in the May 19, 2016 minutes. All those in favor? They're approved. Next on our agenda is a public hearing regarding parking on Surf Road. Um, I would remind everyone to maintain decorum as per the town, town council rules. If you would like to speak, would you please queue up, you know, to <coughs> save time for everyone. Um, and there is a three minute limit and um, we need your name and address. So I will now open the public hearing on parking on Surf Road. Would anyone like to address the council in this public hearing?
Francis Minden, 5 Surf Road. Uh, we've put a lot of discussion into this parking on Surf Road. Um, we seem to have overlooked one big issue, and that is if we have parking on one side, people on the other side can't get out of their driveways because of the, the, the road is so narrow that when I back out of my drive, I back to the very edge of my neighbor across the street lawn. And I know that case exists on, on several different driveways on Surf Road. Um, and I, that's all that I wanted to bring up on that issue. Okay, thank you. My name is Jane Reynolds, and I live at 16 Surf Road. I don't know from whom the request came regarding changing the parking on Surf Road, but I will say as a community, we have been concerned with the activity that has occurred on Cottage Lane with the access to Casino Beach, and it has been an ongoing discussion there's no secret that Surf Road is a narrow road. The primary purpose that someone lives somewhere is for quiet enjoyment, <clears throat> and I don't think the intention of Casino Beach was it to have it become a public beach. Through the Cape Cottage Beach Association, people have been invited to enjoy the beach, and its citizenry has grown in attraction and interest. But to now bring parking to Surf Road will not eliminate the problem that Cottage Lane is experiencing. And I fear that it will increase the amount of traffic with people circling. And in that circling and becoming frustrated, they will become inattentive and more likely to cause an incident, not a favorable one, a very problematic one. Our street is narrow. Our citizenry cares about the area. Today, myself, I went over and drove through the neighborhood, and when I got to the bottom of Cottage Circle, I was stopped by a red cone because somebody had blocked off the lower area for their children at play. And while that's fine, I had no choice but to back up. And when I backed up, I then ran into two cars that were parked on another circle, and it was very difficult for me to get out, and I live there. So I have to say that I don't think it solves the problem of the visitors that are not residents of the area from having more convenience. And to make a decision based on personal convenience and request above and beyond those that reside on the street I find problematic. In addition to not only the circling concern that I have, there is definitely a trend, and I'm not a public safety expert, but there is a trend to ensure that where there are large mass areas for gathering, for frolic, for play, whether it's the orchestra, whether it's a dedicated run, or whether it's Casino Beach, that you don't block off your access um, from an emergency standpoint. And if we have no parking on surf and have on all the years that I've lived there for concerts and for major runs, then I would say that there should continue to be no parking because we are a major access point to Fort Williams. And 24-7, not just the summer, 24-7, we should keep that access as a possibility because we might need it. Additionally, I would have to say that <clears throat> there are a number of people that get confused. Okay. If you could please um, conclude your comments. Mm -hmm. I think that parking on Surf Road will not prevent current traffic problems. It will increase it and lead to a negative incident, and I'm very concerned about it. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes? Oh, okay. My name is Alec Bruce and I live at 5 Cottage Lane, and 
probably most of you know that Cottage Lane is the other half of a horseshoe, uh, the other half being made up by Surf Road. And uh, I'm not sure exact, this was years ago, but uh, those of us living on Cottage Lane petitioned the town to limit parking to one side because of the concern of emergency vehicles accessing. And uh, back in those days, I've lived there since 1990, uh, you know, people, when they were parking, you really couldn't, you could barely get a car. You certainly couldn't get a fire engine. Now that uh, Casino Beach seems to be more uh, active, uh, which is an issue separate from this that, that uh, many of the residents in Cape Cottage Park have been addressing. But one of the outcomes of that increase in activity is additional parking is occurring on Surf Road. And again, many of you may know that Surf Road is even more narrow, quite a bit more narrow than Cottage Lane. So uh, I'm here just in support of residents that couldn't attend the meeting tonight, but have the same concern that, that we had in Cottage Lane about access for emergency vehicles. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else would like to address the council on parking on Surf Road? <clears throat> oh, seeing no one, I declare the public hearing closed. Item 85, 2016, parking on Surf Road. The town council received petitions regarding parking on Surf Road. One petition asks for parking to be prohibited on the side of Surf Road closest to Fort Williams Park. Town Council will consider an amendment to the town's traffic regulations. Um, with the Council's permission um, and the town managers, should we invite Chief Williams to address us at this point on this I'll item? Yes, yeah. please. Okay. Good evening. Um, back in uh, the 1st of April, I was uh, approached and uh, given a petition, a two-sided petition, uh, from, that was signed by about, I believe it was 12 residents um, in the Surf Road area. Sorry. Is my time up? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I'm sure you wish it would. <laughs> they do that to me all the time. And uh, so um, I, I brought it forward to the to Mike and uh, the town manager and uh, said that their request was to look at Surf Road for no parking. Uh, one, one of the um, petitions was for resident parking only. If you remember several years ago we did that in the Maiden Cove area and um, Garden Lane area which is uh, extremely narrow, extremely tight, e even more so than Surf Road is. And it's, it's out of sight also, and I think that's, that's why the resident parking uh, works well in that particular area. Therefore, when I looked at the petitions, and I had both of them, I, I chose to um, favor the no parking on one side of Surf Road. I went down and measured it, and it's about 18 feet wide. So if you park a vehicle on one side of the road, obviously if you park a vehicle on the other side of the road, uh, barely is a motor vehicle going to get through there. Um, but, and so I, I'm more concerned about the emergency access, <clears throat> like the uh, resident from Cottage Lane uh, stated. Um, but I'm, I'm here as a vehicle to bring, the, uh, bring it to forward to the council for the residents. Uh, and, and I think it's good that we have a public hearing on it and uh, hear their opinion on it. Um, as you see, my recommendation is if it does go forward, that it, there be no parking on one side of the roadway, and that would be the side um, that's closest to Fort Williams. Uh, one of the reasons I chose that was people that are pulling up on Shore Road, if they look down and they see the no parking signs, 
maybe they won't go down in that particular area. And I know that the residents down there have been, had their, their uh, share of people that are trying to get to the fort go down through that area. So my thought is if they see the signs, maybe they'll say, oh, there's no parking down there. I'm not going to go down there anyway. So hopefully it would um, cure that problem also. So that's where I'm at. Okay. There are any questions for Chief Williams? Council yes. Lennon? <clears throat> Can you just clarify um, the problem with just having no the parking there? I'm sorry. Say that. Can say you just clarify the, the problem with just saying there's no parking on that street? What's wrong with just saying no parking on? On, on, on both sides of the street? Yeah. You could do that, but... If you, if you did that, uh, I mean, I, I think you hinder your residents from having family over. I know that uh, they have some of the residents that I know down there have older children that have, uh, and, and, and so they would have grandchildren also. So when they come for a weekend, say Thanksgiving, well, then you'd have no parking. What if you said only resident parking? Well, that's what, that was what one of the petitions were. But if you, if you did that, my, my thought is, is that you'd still have people come in there. Um, usually you just have a, one sign when it says resident parking only. Is somebody going to see that coming through if you put it at the beginning of the street? I, I don't know. I just felt, in my opinion, that one side parking would be better and people would notice that more than they would resident parking. Council Grant, um, is, is it the parking currently two-sided on both sides? Is is what is the parking on both sides of the road currently? Co correct. It is. Okay. It is. I'm just I'm thinking with the woman who spoke first, who was saying that um, if one side would prevent her from getting out of her dr her driveway, but currently people can park on both sides. Currently, people can park. So on this both would sides. actually yeah. make it so it would be safer if, as long as they weren't blocking and, her driveway. And if, and if, in fairness, if they did park on both sides, I, I would hope that a resident would give us a call so we could come down and mediate that situation. Okay. Who was there first? I don't know, but you know, uh, I, I know that the officers have uh, enough skill where they can mediate that and make sure that at least we could get a uh, ambulance through or a fire truck through. Hopefully, a, a police officer would be able to get through. Okay. Are there any other questions? Chief Williams? Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to open this to council discussion. Council Garvin? Um, it may or may not be pertinent, but given that um, the Casino Beach uh, factored into some of the comment in the, in the public comment, I am a dues paying member of the Cape Cottage Beach Association, so I just wanted to bring that up as a matter of disclosure. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so let's continue discussion on the, we on the item. Motion? Don't we have a motion? Uh, well, would someone like to make a motion? Or, we don't always. If, if no one feels that there's oh. a need, we... Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, okay, I'll, I'll, okay, I have a comment. I drove down there today, and I was like dumbfounded how narrow it was. I couldn't even imagine a car getting through with someone parked. There was no one parked there, so I couldn't actually test it, but it was... I couldn't envision a car being parked even on one side and a car getting through. They must be able to because they have been, but especially as you get toward the end and it comes down to like a footpath as it goes around the bend. I, I think the less, the more we can discourage parking. And Neil, if you think the best way is to have none on one side because it's a much more visible sign, then I trust you that's the best way. But I mean, my overall opinion is the less parking anyone does there particularly people visiting or trying to go to casino or Fort Williams, the better. It, it seems like such a not good place to park. That was my, my feeling from looking at it today. Anyone else? Council Garvin? Um, I would uh, add to this just the notion of the long range view. I know that later in the year, um, we're sure to be discussing um, a lot of different ramifications of um, the increased use of Fort Williams um, and, and, you know, potential um, mitigation of, of overcrowding there and, and parking concerns there. Um, I have a real legitimate concern that any uh, alteration to current um, parking regulations at Fort Williams could have a negative detrimental impact on a lot of these surrounding neighborhoods, whether it be 
Cape Cottage or um, across the street in Sherwood Forest and things like that. So I think the decision made on this should not be made in the narrow view of the problem that has spurred the discussion around increased activity in the summertime and use of the casino beach and, and increased vehicle traffic associated with that, but also through the, the lens of the longer, pro longer term problem of what happens if we're um, seeing anything that might cause people to look elsewhere to park outside of the park but still try and access the park um, and the sort of unintended consequences that could develop from that, so. All right, thank you. Anyone else? I mean, I, I'd like to add that um, we did receive five emails before this evening uh, from uh, area residents, three being in favor of the proposal, two being against it. Um, I think that, I mean, I'm sensitive to the concerns that there might be an increase in circling, potentially, and also from the uh, citizen who's concerned that with one-sided parking, that she's going to have a tough time backing out. Um, even with those, I think that the prospect of emergency vehicles not being to get down to where they need to go is probably, I mean, that's my overriding concern. Mm -hmm. It seems that parking on one side of surf only uh, at the moment to me seems like the <coughs> most reasonable and safest approach. I do realize it's going to inconvenience some people. Um, so anyway, those are my thoughts. Anything else? Is there a motion? To approve the, yeah? I move we, can sit, I move we amend the town's traffic regulation, section 13-2-3, no parking at any time. There shall be no parking at any time on the southeasterly side of Surf Road beginning at Shore Road and extending to Garden Circle and on either side of Surf Road northerly from 60 feet northerly of Keys Lane to the terminus of Surf Road at Garden Circle. All other sections remain unchanged. Is there a second? Councilor Jordan? Oh, okay. no. I was looking on the map. What is Keys Lane? Is that which one is it? It's private land, the southeast of the southeast. Okay, so it doesn't show up. I'm like looking at it and trying to figure out if there's, you know, hmm? like key nodes or different, different things. I just wanted to make sure it was. And you did second. Yeah. Okay. Mm. All right, all those in favor. Was there I'm sorry. Was there a second? Was there a second? I second. She, so she did second it, yeah. yeah. All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. Item 86, 2016, the Good Table Annual License. It is recommended the Town Council approve the annual malt, vinous, and spiritus license for the Good Table at 537 Ocean House Road. I'd like the Town Manager, manager to, um, if he would please, um, present the, yes, the item. Thank you, uh, Chair Pro Tem. The town clerk uh, asked the different departments if there are any issues, particularly with the operation of the good table, that would uh, reflect on whether or not the, these permits ought to be uh, granted these licenses, and there were none, so it's recommended that you approve the uh, licenses uh, for submission to the state. Excuse me, can I please have quiet? In the chambers, thank you. Um, is there a motion? <laughs> Councilor Jordan? Oh, I just have disclosure that my family business does business with the table. Thank you. Councilor Grant? I move that we approve the annual malt, um, vinous, and spiritus licenses for the good table at 537 Ocean House Road. Second. Is there a second? I notice that the owner of the good table is here. We have another license, and I was getting them mixed up in my mind at the moment. Um, so I just wanted to point that out if anyone has any questions for Mr. Kostopoulos. No? Any other discussion? All those in favor? It's approved. All right. Next item, item 87, 2016, the local buzz annual licenses. It is recommended the town council approve the annual malt, vinous, and spiritus licenses and special amusement permit for the local buzz at 327 Ocean House Road. And again, if the town manager could present the item. Yes, thank you. Everything I just said for the good table also applies to local buzz. Uh, the departments were queried and there were no issues. Do I have a motion? 
Council Lynn? Uh, I move we approve the annual malt, Venice, and spiritus license uh, and special movement permit, permit for the local buzz at 327 Ocean House Road. Is there a second? Councilor Garvin? Again, I noticed that former Councilor Jamie Wagner is here, the owner of the local buzz. If anyone has any questions, concerns? No? Great. Wants to speak. Would you like to? Okay. What spirit is? Oh. No whiskey. Beer and wine. Beer and wine. Oh, I thought it was like ah, people okay. being joyful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you want me to remake the motion? Uh, the minutes will so reflect. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? <coughs> All those in favor? It's approved. Next item, 88-2016, the Thomas Memorial Library policy updates. And it, I would like to ask the town manager to present this item. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Pro Tem. I'd like to ask that this be tabled. The, is, everyone had trouble opening the gaming room procedure mm -hmm. file. Yep. Uh, I understand the, the library trustees uh, want to look again at the displays and exhibits policy and the building policy. So I'd recommend you table the item awaiting hearing back from them. Councilor Garvin? I move that we table number 882016. There. Memorial Library Policy Office. Sorry. Is there a second? Oh. I'll second that. Or Caitlin. Right, yeah. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? It's approved. We'll table that item. Okay. Item number 89, 2016. The Cape Elizabeth Land Trust requests for donation to assist in purchase of glue property near Jewel Road. Again, I'd like to ask the town manager to present this item. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. It, I think everyone's aware that the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust is, is contemplating an exciting purchase of what's known as the Glue property near Jewett Road. It's off Gladys Road, which is off Fowler Road. It's a 22.8 acre parcel. Uh, the Land Trust had sent a letter uh, to the town suggesting that we might like to make a donation. Uh, they didn't specify any certain amount, uh, but in the past the town had donated uh, 75, excuse me, 33% uh, uh, toward a, a couple of different purchases. Uh, the town council had discussed this at one point and suggested that they might consider a $75,000 donation. Uh, the Conservation Commission uh, met and reviewed this and specifically recommended a $75,000 donation, but they also did it and they, they had a, had it that's in your packet or, you know, online, a list of, uh, you know, different restrictions they want to look at. <coughs> you know, it, we haven't actually had our town attorney look at this yet. And it, it strikes me that the, the two parties are very close together, but, but, the, but there is a difference on, on what rights, if any, the town would have going forward on the management of the property. And, you know, the land trust, excuse me, the Conservation Commission seems to have a pretty strong position. Uh, the land trust has communicated in a letter that's attached to an exhibit uh, that they're not exactly happy with that. You know, I think you could debate those things. You could, you know, I would rather not draw lines in the sand right now. You know, I think that the real objectives are, and I've, ex I've explained this in different meetings with the land trust, is that the town's interest is, is, is making sure there's a conservation restriction on the land. What legal instrument form that takes, I'm not sure, but you know, there's many different instruments to do that. Let the lawyers figure it, figure it out. Uh, second, and within that legal framework document, whatever it is, uh, you know, the, the, the main concern that the Conservation Commission has that I think overrides everything is that you know, we want to see it maintained in its natural beauty and you know, all those provisions that would generally go into a conservation easement. Second, uh, that th we want to see public access, and that's usually in, in, in Cape Elizabeth defined as trails. You know, beyond that, you, you get into some other issues there that get kind of sticky and get emotional and get people get excited about. And, you know, and, you know I'm not sure the parties is, are really that far apart. However, you'd think so by the volume of, you know, visits and calls and some of those things, and I don't know. Uh, so, you know, so I really think that, you know, this ought to be referred, uh, you know, to come back to you next month at, 
July 11th, you know, after you've had the land trust has had a chance to speak and whoever else wants to speak, uh, that it ought to be tabled until July 11th and, and to ask the town attorney to work with the representative of the land trust to uh, see if we can work out an amicable uh, resolution uh, so that uh, you know, the, ma the main objectives that we commonly share are accomplished, which, which is conservation of the land in, in is, it, its natural beauty and public access. And to me, you know, the, the wording that I draft the agenda is consistent uh, with the Conservation Commission recommendation. And I don't use the word consistent to mean that it has to be 100% of what the Conservation Commission said. Consistent means that it needs to follow those general principles and it needs to look toward those objectives, but I really would hope that the parties can get together and, you know, we can celebrate working cooperatively with the, the land trust uh, to achieve something that's going to be very good for citizens for uh, the millenniums to come. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there any discussion from the council? I didn't want to cut off the land trust from doing yeah. a comment. No. Well, let me ask this then. Would the council like to hear from the land trust before we continue with our own discussion? Sure. Here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Would anyone like from the land trust like to address the council? Thank you. And I'm Cindy Crum and. Since I don't reside in Cape Elizabeth, I have read that I can also state my affiliation in town, which is that I'm the executive director of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. And firstly, I want to um, just really thank you as a new executive director to an organization in town. I want to thank you for your past support of the Land Trust. It's really been wonderful to hear what the town has done with the Land Trust and in donations for the Land Trust over quite a few years and I must say that I'm very impressed by that and it's great to step into a position where there is that type of relationship with the town. I think one thing that has really been brought to light with these discussions with the Conservation Commission and with um, Mr. McGovern, the town manager, has been that there really is even more opportunity for collaboration and I would agree with Mr. McGovern that, that both sides of the playing field, the town and CELT, are very interested in collaborating on, on many of these issues. So I think we have an opportunity ahead of us and I think this is a perfect property to do something like that because there is the green belt there, there is opportunity for the type of connectivity that's so critical to the town's mission in their green belt plan. Um, and, and I guess, you know, the other thing that I would say is that in terms of the primary concerns in terms of being legally bound that definitely the conservation value and the public access, whatever types of documents we do end up using will be legally bound on that property. That's what the land trust is about. That's what would happen. So, so I did want to just really point that out. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilor Jordan. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, I'm Elizabeth Goodspeed, 59 Belfield Road, speaking as a CELT board member, and I'm speaking on behalf tonight of the whole CELT board, which unanimously supports the idea of further collaboration with the Conservation Commission going forward. And as Cindy said, this is really a perfect property for that because um, we can work together on the placement of trails, creation of new trails, um, non-motorized um, public access uses, and also increasing connectivity with both existing and future town trails. Um, and I guess what we would like to see tonight is pretty much what you um, just outlined, Mr. McGovern, um, just that the donation be approved contingent on an agreement being worked out that takes into consideration both the Conservation Commission's motion as well as the concern that SELF had that was um, relayed in the letter. So thank you. Elizabeth, we yeah. need your address, please. Oh, I'm sorry, 59 Belfield Road. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. So, councilors, Councilor Jordan, you were. Okay. 
No, go right. Well, <laughs> go right ahead, and then we we can have a motion and a second and start our discussion. Then. Um, I didn't. If we are looking to table it, or if we could make a motion to commit seventy-five thousand to the purchase of the glue property, pending the outcome of negotiations of an agreement between the town of Cape Elizabeth and Salt. I'll second that. Mm -hmm. Okay, discussion. Question yep. for the manager. Hmm? Um, with this proposed commitment, I believe that draws down or, or merely completely draws down the land acquisition fund, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it reduces it. You know, it, it w there'll be 32,000 that you appropriated additionally to it next year. And with, with that 32,000, this would be after July 1, there would be some more monies available. So, but it, it's going to be tight. It's, uh, we, we're essentially drawing it down to almost nothing. Okay. Anyone else? Councilor Grannon? I guess I'll just say that I, I think it's a fabulous opportunity for our town to um, help you know, um, buy this property. Um, and also, um, I think, I'm, I have full faith that we will be able to, um, the town attorney can come to some type of resolution between the Conservation Commission and um, the mission, uh, upholding the mission of what CELT stands for, and really have a complementary um, partnership going forward. So um, I have, in full support, I guess my one question would be, um, so can we approve it continuously, contingently on, um, and then would that, um, the attorney's draft come back in um, July. We could see it then. And would it be, so are we approving it, obviously, contingent on the draft from the attorneys? Do we have, then have to approve the draft in July? That, that would be, yeah, yeah, let me. Well, it depends on what the motion is. And I wrote down the motion is to conditionally approve a $75,000 donation pending the outcome of negotiations between CELT and the town. Yes. Was that what the motion was? Yes. Yes, I think you, you look at the wording of what the motion is, and uh, that is what the motion is. Okay, so we'll wait. Okay. So the answer to your question would be yes, then. It sounds like it, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that would be an, my interpretation, that we would then see the attorney's drafts and, and, and approve those and maybe go through several, several stages of approval, who knows, but that we would have that, that opportunity. Um, any other comments? No second. Um, I think it was. I did. Yeah. Councilor Jordan. I just wanted to comment that the agreement will be between Celt and the town of Cape Elizabeth. So I wanted, to, as we'll get down further into the agenda, the Conservation Commission is an advisory group to the town. So that we want to be clear that it is not going to be an agreement between the Conservation Commission and Celt. It is an agreement between the town and Celt. So that mm -hmm. okay. it's. Our responsibility as counselors. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Thank you. I I am in support of Councillor Jordan's motion. I think uh, I mean I read through all the documents um, and I appreciate the time the land trust has given to um, looking into this. I I also compliment the conservation commission for their hard work and uh, interest in representing um, the interests of the town and advising the council on their thoughts. But I think given everything we've read that putting this in the hands of the lawyers to come up with something that we can jointly work on is, is appropriate. So, any other discussion? All those in favor? It's approved. Next item, item 90, 2016, approval of quick claim deed. It's recommended that the town council authorize the town manager to execute a quick claim deed for property at 6 Pine Point Road to the estate of William Lowell. All back taxes have been paid. Would you like to address this? I'd be happy to. Uh, buddy, within the last year, the town foreclosed on property on 6 Pine Point, Pine Point Road for the non-payment of taxes. It was from the estate of a longtime resident of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, the family has since paid the back taxes. Uh, we have not. We, we would formally accept them only upon approval of you. The quit claim deed. And what a quit claim deed says basically is we release our foreclosure. We're we're quitting our claim on any attachment we have on the property. So it would revert back to the uh, estate of William Lowell. I have a question. So then this allows the estate to proceed with probation and all that. 
it, it gives them back full title to the property subject to whatever other uh, restrictions that there, there may be on the property. But the town quit claims its attachment on the property. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion? Um, I move we authorize the town manager to execute a quit claim deed for property at Six Pine Point Road to the estate of William Lowell. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Lennon, any further discussion? All those in favor? It's approved. <clears throat> item, num item number 91, 2016, update of ordinances relating to boards and commissions. The ordinance committee has completed its work reviewing all of the provisions relating to the town's board, <coughs> boards and commissions and is recommending a replacement, chapter four, of the code of ordinances establishing boards and committees and revised sections of chapter 18, which is the conservation ordinance and chapter 24, which is the shooting range ordinance. It is recommended that the proposed amendments be referred to a public hearing on July 11, 2016 at 7 p.m. at the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall. The committee also made other recommendations which are proposed to be referred to at a workshop to be scheduled. I'd like to turn this over to the ordinance committee chairman, Councilor Jordan, to tell us about all of this work <laughs> and what it means. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we met the ordinance committee uh, six times to discuss the full replacement of the boards and committee ordinance. We changed several things, relocated a few things to different sections of our ordinance, including relocating the open space evaluation and preservation program into the conservation ordinance, as well as changing the composition of the firing range committee within the shooting range ordinance. We also created um, bylaws within the ordinance so that all standing committees can follow a single unit of bylaws instead of having to create their own. We also focused on making sure all committees were clearly advisory to the town council, removing any operational duties or activities that were not necessary within the committees. We also made that had been previously ad hoc committees that have been continuous, such as the recycling committee, into a standing committee so that they can move forward with full committee stature, as well as welcome the community services committee that will be coming over when we take over community services on July 1. Um, other than that, we created several recommendations that we've asked the town council as a whole to reflect on at the workshop, including the um, membership number of committees whether it is appropriate to reduce some of them to five rather than keeping them at seven. Um, the implementation of all of these new duties and, and purposes, we want to make sure that it is unified across all town you know, media, make sure it's uh, corrected on the websites, make sure all the ordinances are up to date so that it's all the same and all the information is being sought, thought, sought out and is correct. Um, we are asking that the town council review the role of the town liaison and what exactly that means. And then there's a few issues with the, the by, with bylaws of the Thomas Memorial Library Foundation. Because we changed all the committees to committees instead of commissions or trustees, we had to do, um, we had to create, create it so that the town council was the now the trustees of the Thomas Memorial Library. And in doing that, we create a little issue by having town councilors and trustees on the library foundation. So we end up with more town councilors perhaps on the foundation than we want. So we just need a little wordsmithing of, of that so that we can have some more citizens on there rather than town councilors. And then we request um, the, the senior representation on the Community Services Committee to discuss um, advising the appointments committee that we try our best to have representation of a senior on the Community Services Committee. And so I make a motion that we accept the report, the new Boards and Commissions Ordinance, set it for a public hearing for next month in July, and that we schedule to discuss these recommendations on the earliest workshop to our chair's convenience. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. Any questions? Council Lennon? 
I thought in the advisory portion that we we're going to talk about in the workshop, we had also put out there that we might think about uh, uh, term limits of, of three terms, nine years. Didn't we put that? And it wasn't no, on our recommendations that we discussed at the meeting. Them. We had a lengthy conversation about that, don't you remember? And Maureen said, oh, the planning board should definitely be at least nine because if they get up to speed and so forth and whatnot. We wrote it in the bylaws, I thought. We have term limits in the ordinance, correct? Okay, There's but you're saying that wasn't into a change? The ordinance. Right, but there was, we didn't change anything, so we didn't put anything to be discussed as a whole council. Okay, so There's, it's already written in there? There's currently two term limit, right? You can serve two terms, or is it three? It's three. Can I'd have to. I believe it's three consecutive terms. Right. That's right. You can only Without be chairman. You can only be you can chairman. Only chair two years. Two. Now. Okay. Two, two I years. thought we were going to discuss that, years. but great. No. No. Any other questions or thoughts? Well, I'd like to say that it was quite an interesting process. Um, together with Councilor Jordan, and Sarah, uh, Councilor Lennon, and myself, we we are the ordinance committee. Um, I think it was. It was very interesting to go through this, you know, at that depth of level. And I think that um, I'm, I'm very pleased with what we came up with. I think that we did a great job uh, making things more uniform. Yes. I mean, that was, a, you know, that was really, uh, I think, an important part of what we did. So that when you read through it, you'll see that there is a, there's very similar language with purpose, duties, responsibilities. Things are laid out in the very beginning for all committees, and then as as committees go through, we go through those. The the setup is the same as far as definition, the purpose, and so forth. And I think that's going to make it a lot easier for people, you know, going forward to quickly look up, you know, these boards and committees and see what they are and see what they do. And it'll be a lot easier to sift through that. Um, so I I thought that in particular. Um, was really important. Um, the other thought is behind changing the name from commission to committee, a couple of reasons. Um, you know, these are all advisory. The word commission has a heavier, heavier tone to it. But also, we, uh, those of us who have served on appointments in the past, have learned that we um, there is there's sometimes the expectation when somebody is going to volunteer to serve on a a board of trustee or on a commission that there might be a financial expectation. And so we certainly want to avoid that. So those were the reasons behind the proposed change to to have everything be a committee. So anyway, any, any other thoughts? Sorry, one more yeah. to add. I agree with everything you said. I also think we made it clear, clearer. I was happy as an English major that our language is nice and terse now. <laughs> And also, I'd just like to thank Maureen, who did an enormous amount of work. She really did the, the heavy lifting in some ways. She'd bring us new drafts every, every um, meeting that we could work on and go from there. So just to give a shout out to her. Mm -hmm. Thank you, absolutely. All those in favor? It's approved. Item 92, 2016, Community Services Transition. Uh, I'm sorry, Community Services Program Transition. I would like to again ask the town manager to present this item. Yes, uh, thank you. The community services program is transitioning from being under the responsibility of the school department to being a municipal department effective July 1. In order to do that, we've looked through uh, our different uh, ordinances and codes and, and looked to see what needs to be brought up to date to do that. Uh, the personnel code, the only change that's, that's needed is in Appendix A of the personnel code, it lists salaried positions. And the community services director and the aquatics director are salaried positions within the school department. Their wages are sufficient in, uh, with the new Obama's uh, regulation. Some of you may have seen about what, what's a salaried position and what's not. It, it, they're, they're, they're within the guidelines, even the new guidelines. So it's recommended that those two positions be added to the list in Appendix A the personnel code. Secondly, the administrative code spells out what the different municipal departments are, who the department head is, and the purposes of the different departments. So it's proposed that, that formally community services be added as municipal department, that the department head 
be listed as a community services director, and then there's other sections that say what are the responsibilities of a department head and how they how that all fits. So it just incorporates them into the same the same regime as uh, as everyone else. Uh, and then you know I attempted to list what I thought were the purposes of the of, of what the department does, and uh, I, I checked to see what the school department had. They didn't have much. It's the listing there is a little lengthier than we had, but emphasis on helping populations of all ages, the seniors overseeing the pool, the fitness center, and, and looking to promote wellness and, and good fitness uh, generally in the community and to provide enrichment with cultural, social op uh, opportunities, educational opportunities, facilities. Uh, administrative code and personnel code don't need public hearing, so uh, I propose that you, you adopt those. Uh, we also have a community services advisory commission currently uh, that uh, would be in total limbo uh, on June 30 if uh, nothing happens. So what I'm proposing is that you set up on an interim basis uh, an ad hoc committee uh, that's called the community services committee. It has seven members and the purpose of the duties as outlined. It, it, what I did is took exactly what the ordinance committee just recommended the exact language in every respect and just that would be the language that would fit the ad hoc committee until such time as you appointed the formal committee uh, uh, you know upon enactment of, of the, the new ordinance or something close to it and finally there's the question what happens to the terms of all the people that were appointed by the school board and it's proposed that uh, uh, that they continue to continue to serve until their existing terms expire uh, you know, without interruption and their names and addresses and those terms are listed here on the agenda for your consideration. Thank you. Is there a motion? Just as a point of procedure, are we, do we need to break these things up into separate motions or? Uh, no, I, no, I think it, 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 it depends on how you make the motion. If you make the motion is to accept the recommendations in item number 92 and Ad adopt the changes to the personnel code, the administrative code, then it's all done. I was going to at least break it into the adoption of the personnel code and administrative code and then separate the committee. Whatever you Because I think that for that to come back, because that's going to need to come back as a second issue uh, as it's only an interim decision. Okay, so, right? so, so to help this, this along. Okay. I, I so I, I move that we adopt the personnel code and administrative code as recommended under agenda item 922016. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Sarah. Sarah. Councilwoman. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. All those in favor? It's approved. And is there a second motion? I also move that we, um, per the recommendation here, create an ad hoc interim community services committee with membership purpose and duties as outlined herein, and that the current members be continued over and confirmed onto this interim community services committee, and those members are outlined in the recommendation. Is there a second? I'll second that. Any discussion? So just to be clear, um, we will, uh, the motion is expressing that once the transition uh, it occurs as of July 1, this committee, as named, will then become an ad hoc committee. Yes, the, if the minutes could reflect that the motion should be effective July 1, if that wasn't clear. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Jordan? And then should the new boards and committees ordinance take effect? after our public hearing, so it's probably most likely September 11th. This ad hoc committee moves in to become that committee. Can we make that all into one motion? Do we have to come back? What, yes. through, through the chip. What, what the, the intent is, is if that ordinance as you proposed is adopted after public hearing, we would, we would look at it and at that same meeting where you adopt it, we would have motions similar to this okay. to appoint members of the Thomas Library, Thomas Moore Library Committee of the Riverside Cemetery Committee and all that so that it's clear that the transition 
has occurred and that the, the, the terms are continuing on the same basis. We'll, we'll go through a whole series. This one. Yep, great question. Sure Thank everything's you. Dotted. And I purposefully did not indicate sort of a, an, a sunset date when I said interim because of not okay. knowing when Wait. we'll actually take that up. So yep. it's intentionally indefinite. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All those in favor? It's approved. <clears throat> Item 93, 2016, Eastman Meadows Affordable Housing. And again, I'll ask the town manager to present this item. We, ha we have uh, dealt with this issue before, I know. We, we have. Yeah. Uh, in 1992, the town adopted some mandatory affordable housing requirements, which basically said if you had a development of so many units, for every so many units you had to set aside so many units as either low income or moderate. Uh, income. If you did chose the moderate, you know, they were slightly more than if you chose the low income that required. What's happened was when, when Eastern Meadows was approved, uh, they indicated that there'd be so many moderate income housing and that they were allowed a, a income of up to 114000 but that the sale price would need to be uh, an amount for a moderate income house based on certain federal guidelines. Well, well, you look at that now, and it comes out to the houses need to be sold for three hundred ninety-five thousand twenty-two dollars. You know, the, the developer uh, Fitzpatrick Associates has, or whatever the corporate title is, I'm not sure what it is, Eastman Meadows LLC, whatever it's called, has been unable to find buyers willing to spend almost four hundred thousand dollars and to have a restriction on their property that says that any gain in the, in the, the value of the house. Uh, needs to be split evenly between the town and by uh, and themselves. People <laughs> just aren't willing to spend four hundred thousand dollars to deal with that provision. The planning board's looking at this. They're looking at uh, they're having, I think, a public hearing. I think this month on some technical amendments to the ordinance that would change the provision so that uh, the numbers should work a lot better and perhaps be realistic. So we're not into this. But in the meantime. You know, uh, Joel Fitzpatrick, uh, as the owner, has you know shown us data that has looked at how long the houses have been on the market, and you know that he's tried to sell them for this amount, and has done you know all the due diligence, and just can't sell them. <coughs> so there's a provision in the ordinance that says that you can waive the town's right to purchase the the units that have remained unsold because there's a provision that for unsold we have to buy them. Uh, we're not really interested in doing that, but you can waive that requirement. Uh, and that uh, the monies, uh, that they could be sold to non-qualified buyers at market rates with any excess over the 395,022 for each unit to provide it to the town for a, other affordable housing. So it would make the, the, them saleable, it would make them, put them out available for the market. Uh, the developer doesn't make any more money other than the fact he, he gets rid of the burden of, of trying to sell them for, for rates that no one wants to buy them at. So I'd, I'd recommend that you approve the, the, the uh, waiving your right to purchase them uh, with the understanding that the two units could be sold to non-qualified buyers at market <coughs> rate with any access over 395022 for each unit to be provided to the town to put in an account for other affordable housing. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there a motion? Sure. Um, I move that we waive the town's right to purchase two affordable housing units at Eastman Meadows that have remained unsold for some time. The two units could be sold to non-qualified buyers at the market rates with any excess over 395.022 for each unit to be provided to the town for other affordable housing. Is there a second? Second. Council Lennon, any discussion? I have a question. So. Uh, Council Evelyn, you uh, brought up the fact that we dealt with this previously mm -hmm. um, for a, a, two separate units, right? Have those sold and have we recognized any gains from those? Do you know, Mike? I, I don't know the answer. I, I believe they did and I, you know, I'm sure there's money in the account that, that does it. I can, I, I'll get, I don't know if it's, I'll, I'll get you that information, uh, find out what it is. I'll Great. give it. I won't give it to you. I'll, I'll send an email to the whole council. Sure. Thanks. We'll okay. post it online. The answer. <coughs> council Jordan. Oh, so I was just joking with Council Gardner that well, hopefully maybe there will be a bidding war in the price. 
<laughs> will go up and we can slip that back into the land acquisition fund. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we'll go into affordable housing. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Huh? All those in favor? It's approved. Item 94, 2016, year-end budget shortfalls. The overall budget is in great shape as we near the end of the fiscal year. The pro charter provides that no department is permitted to exceed its budget without council authorization. Again, the town manager could just tell us a little more about these items. For at least two straight years, and I haven't looked back at previous years, we have two departments that have not been able to stay within their appropriations uh, for the, the, the appropriate fiscal year. One is human services, and it's solely because of general assistance payments that are mandated by the state and involves helping out some needy families, with, particularly with housing needs uh, in the year beginning July 1. So it's proposed to revise the appropriation uh, from 52607 to 80000 We've spent about 70000 at the as of June 1st. So there's an allowance in there to make sure we, we can account for the needs in, in June. Secondly, facilities management, uh, it's about the same as last year. Uh, it's proposed to revise the appropriation by a, a little over uh, $12,655 up to $225,000. And that's, you know, we, we, get, we get a lot of contracts like to take care of elevators and elevator inspections and sprinklers and it, it just, you know, permits for this, and permits for that, the state, and as well as, you know, all of the, the repairs and, uh, you know, we, we, we're just uh, over budget and uh, not a place we like to be, but overall you look at the budget and, uh, you know, we're in, we're in great shape, but these two accounts need, need, your, uh, need your support and, uh, and without it, uh, would be in real tough shape in human services uh, because we're mandated by the state to provide to those needs. And the facilities management, uh, you know, it's, uh, we've, we've overspent it just a little bit and I've created a little bit of an allowance in case some things go wrong, as they often do, uh, between now and the end of the month. Thank you. Is there a motion? Council Lennon? Can I just ask a quick question? Why don't we just more in the budget for these if they continually uh, run on above. Uh, we, we need to. Yeah. <laughs> no. You know, in fact, no, uh, next year. through the chair, before I put together next year's budget, I'm going to look at not only this year and last year, but I'm going to take the time to look at the last few years to see what, what the patterns have been. And I think with the human service, it was hoped that the, you know, the recession would be over, but you know, everyone knows that the recession didn't lift all boats, and some people are still having challenges. And, as a result, that has not gone down like we would have hoped that it might have. Okay, I'll make a motion. I hope that um, we approve the additional appropriations to the budget. Um, in 410 Human Services, we revise the appropriation from 52,607 to 88, I'm sorry, 80,000. And in the 600s, the facility management, uh, we revise the appropriation from $212,345 to $225,000. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Also, Grennan, any, any discussion? Any more discussion? Okay. All those in favor? It's approved. All right, that's the end of items on tonight's agenda. At this moment, citizens may raise any topic that's not on the agenda but pertains to Cape Elizabeth government. Seeing no one. Could I comment on that? Yes. Yeah, Kathy Ray, when I was, I was going over the agenda with her to prepare her for chairing the meeting, she questioned the wording on this. And, and I just, this wording, it sometimes has been used, but it's not been used recently. Right. And, and the feeling is that this is citizens' item not on the agenda. The, the intent is that it has to pertain to something to local government and that well, we don't want it to be just a forum for someone to come and say why Donald Trump ought to be elected president or, or why you know, the Libertarian Party candidate ought to be elected president or Hillary ought to be. So anyway, that's the intent is that the issues have to pertain to capable local government and uh, that we, we think and believe that's the intent of what's in the council rules. Thank you. You know, I, <clears throat> I saw that. And I liked it. <laughs> I thought, oh, this is good. 
Um, so anyway, uh, okay. May I you have a motion? Sure. Second it. Councilor Grennan. All those in favor? We are adjourned. <laughs>